Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started here up there. Uh, I don't know how long we'll, we'll go today. This is, I see that we got somewhat of a thin group so far. Maybe, of course, people do show up a little late, but is everyone going out of town over the weekend? Yes. No one, so come tomorrow, this place will be a ghost town out there. Ah, uh, that's good. Actually, we're supposed to be going to Malacca for a wedding, but this thing here is... No, nope, I can't. I thought maybe I could slide it over a little bit. To I guess it's kind of, that's the way it is right there. <laughs> there. Nope, it's locked in, it's locked into place. <laughs> there, that didn't help me. All right, let me just kind of continue on. I, I'm going to the other book today for this discussion, just the kind of contrast that they have the same information. And I'm just going to kind of go into a little bit more of the addressing modes and the instruction set that, we've, that we're going to be using to do that there. As I said, next... Ah, there. ah here comes the rest of the group here. As I recall, this is the larger of the two groups up there. So, there. So, again, we've got various addressing modes here, here that we look at. And there's, here's another example. Let me put this in the read mode here. We lose too much of the screen with uh, right there. But I'm just going to kind of look at, look look at this co this book here and kind of pull examples of the code out. This, I'm in the McKinsey book, which is the black book that was posted up that there. So there's a instruction, there's a re special function register called the data pointer, and that one is a very important one because that particular one is used to do exactly what it says, to point to data. And that's how we would normally... Ah, come on in here. There. Morning, morning. Up there. So when we look at the data pointer up there, and that is actually a 16-bit register up there. So it's a 16-bit register, and it's a very important one because, as I said, it's used to, you know, there's other registers that we talk about, the stack pointer, We'll talk about the stack pointer later, right there, as I go through and I'm going to strip right there, the flags. But I, I want to jump ahead to, you know, the B register. The stack pointer I'll come back to later, later this morning, but I want to talk about the data pointer first. And this is a 16 register, and the reason we do that is because we can increment that and point to the next location in memory. So we can set an array up. Now an array can be anything from a text. You know, if we, if we store text, for example, in a microcontroller, we normally store it as an array of characters. Now when you took C, did you, when you, when you defined a string, how did you define a string? Did you define it as, a, as an array of character? In other words, a 20 character st string, you would define it as a char bracket tw 20 up there. So, so th up there. So what this is basically saying is that we're going to move into the A register, which is the accumulator. I talked a little bit about the accumulator yesterday. That's our primary register in the 8051 and the 8086 or any other microprocessor, the accumulator is the register that you normally do 90% of your work with out there. That's what the register up there, and it's the most versatile register. If, typically, if you say, for example, use the add, the, the results are stored in the accumulator up there. So what this particular short little piece of instruction is showing us how to do is external data or data memory. It's a 16-bit register. The 8051 can address up to 64K of memory, and the memory is the same whether it's in the ROM or in the RAM in terms of how we address it right there. So later on, we're going to be looking at how we would set up a, a 
an array of characters. But what we're doing here is we're moving into a the number 55H right there. And we're moving into the data pointer, the actual address that, that, that we want to, want to put there. Now later on what we'll be doing is we'll define, say for example, a string in our defined byte segment beginning. Ah. I knew we'd fill up before the end. That there. Yeah. Actually, I think I commented about starting at 8.15 for this reason before, right? I probably should wait till 8.15. Actually, that there. Okay. Going back, finishing this here, we move into A, the actual number 55. Remember the number sign means that we're actually moving the, the immediate data. The number sign means immediate. That there. Then we're moving into the data pointer. 1,000 hex. That is, again, it's got the number sign, so that's the actual physical address that there. In other words, we're moving 1,000 hex, and that's a 16-bit register, so it's got four digits that there. It's one of the few that act, that has four digits there. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to move external, and the move X is a new instruction. It means the moved external memory right there, which means that it has a 16-bit address and it's being placed elsewhere now. This is a little confusing, but because this particular book talks about the original 8051, the Silicon Labs uses external memory, but it's internal to the chip, that there, because if you remember the original 8051 only had a very small amount of memory to it, and it was external, so the instructions that the 8051, as we looked at, has like 4K of RAM <coughs> on it, and it's got like, some of them have got like 32K of, uh, of PROM, depending on which ones we have. So from the standpoint of the language, when we're dealing with the assembler, we treat some of the memory as external, even though it's within the same chip, because it's external to the 8051 core. Because if we go went back and looked at the model for the Silicon Labs, you saw that the core was just part of that. And then everything else was built around it. So it's external to the core. So what we're doing is we're moving the contents of A, which we set to 55, to the date to the memory location pointed to by the data pointer. The ampersand means the con you know the address is is within is in the data pointer. So as we look at this addressing mode here, we're using two different types of addressing. The number sign means is, is, the, is immediate data. So we're moving the number 55 here into A. We're also moving the number 1,000 hex into, into the data pointer. But here we're moving from A, which contains the number 55. So this is the contents of A is being moved to memory location pointed to by the data pointer. So this particular short three lines piece of code shows three different addressing modes right there. So we're moving the number 55 into the register A. So that's direct address. This is immediate being moved into uh, into a direct at register A. And then we're moving immediate into another register and then we're moving the contents of the register which is 55 to the address pointed to by the data pointer right there. So that there and it's very important that you get these addressing modes down because those will be used multiple times and they really that there. That there. And one other thing I should kind of point out that you probably saw that in your 8086 class, but assembly language instructions tend to work backwards from normal logic. Yes. We're moving into A, the number 55. Most people would tend to think that you're, we're moving, we, we would write that, move the number 55 into A, <coughs> and, you would, <coughs> and you would write move number 55 comma A, but it goes from right to left. So it's whatever's on the right side, in this case, 
the 55 is moved 2A. It goes this direction, from right to left. 55 is moved to A. 1,000 is moved to the data pointer. The content of A is moved to the to memory location 1,000. We know it's 1,000 because we have the up there. And then we could do a loop where we increment this and point to the next one right there. Okay. There, then we've got the the port registers. We talked a little bit about those yesterday. I'm not those up there. Those are the the four ports. Port zero through port three. Our chip has only got two ports right there. And we've got several commands that we can use for that. The one that I forgot was the set byte. I tried set right there. And as you recall yesterday when I did the example, I didn't bring the board with me today. I, I meant to, to grab it that there. If I need it, I can go up and get it <laughs> that there. But set byte just simply puts a one in that particular location. Clear byte just turns it, turns it off that there. And this, they give the example, is this could be anything on that particular byte because that there, it can be a motor that we're turning on and off, and we're turning on an LED because that's all we've got on our board, but it could be a motor, it could be a valve that we're opening, it can be a heating element for an oven, it can be anything. So when we, when we turn on a byte like that, you know, we've got to think in terms of physical hardware, what is connected to that particular one. You know, you know we're, we're running this class with a very basic board, if we had or resources, we'd probably be doing things like putting motors on that out there, and hopefully we got I can get some before the end of the semester. Now, this command here set using port 1.1. Yesterday, remember, I used an equate command right there, and I can pull that up right there. Let me just go ahead and pull that up from yesterday, wherever it is, right here. right here. See that there. So I'm using that port 1.0 and 1.1 right there. So all this simply tells, this equate does, is this tells the assembler whenever it sees green LED to replace it with P1.0 right there. So that's just simply a command that we're going to be using in the assembler right, right there. So this is that there, so we, so as you recall, I had two LEDs. One was connected to port 1.0, 1.1, right there. So that's essentially all we're doing there. Now, going back to this table here, wherever this table is, right here. Uh, and, and again, these tables are a little bit different. Yeah, all right. This is similar to the table I had yesterday in the other book, because that particular author, if you were to look at the other book that I was using yesterday, they used this as their number one reference. So, they, so when they wrote that book, they used the tables from this book. So that's why you see a lot of overlap up there. But if you look at port one right here is, on, is at location 90 right there, but the the seven bits in port one are defined by these bit addresses, right here, 90 through 97. So port one is actually, or port 1.0 is actually bit address 90. Port 1.1 is bit address 91. The assembler knows when I use a bit instruction, and a bit instruction is an instruction such as set byte, S-E-T-B, that set byte. When it sees that instruction, it expects to see a bit address there after that. And a bit address, in the case of our code, was green LED because we set that as port 1.0 or 1.1. I can't remember that there. Now, I also, in the code yesterday, and I'm going through a lot and reviewing a lot of this because I know we, you saw it yesterday for the first time. It probably went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> is, is that a fair statement, right? So, uh, 
up there. <laughs> Maybe she does want to come in. <laughs> there. So I, so it's important, I think, to, to go through it multiple times to make sure that you understand what I covered yesterday. So, but when I went through yesterday, and I'm going to go through and look at this code here yesterday, remember that I included this file right here. Everyone remember that I talked about that, that file yesterday. That, there. that file there includes the information up there. And let me just go ahead and pull that file open right there. Right there. When I look at this file, this file actually contains that table right there. And as I go through here, down here, I will get to a location where I have bit definitions right here. You see right here, this is this portion of that file defines all the various bits. All right, up there, up there, and they contain the address right here. So this have, this right here actually contains the address. Now things get somewhat confusing because we sometimes have the same address for a byte register as we do for a bit register. For example, here's the watchdog timer control right there. That's data, that's 97. That's a, that's a byte address right there. If we come down through here further down, we should have port, where port one is defined. Oh, port one should be defined in here. Did I? I know it was defined yesterday when I looked at it. P1, yeah, P1 is defined. External interrupt. Yeah, P1 is defined right there at location 90. Yeah, yeah, I see, but it doesn't give me the bit location for it. Evidently, this doesn't, this particular, they don't have to in this particular case. Not there. I expect to see it, see it in the bit locations right here, but. Not there. All right, well, I'm not gonna dwell on if it's not there, it's not in that file, that, that's fine. Go back to here. Mm. Read mode, right here's port one, and we can address the individual bits by their bit address right there. So what this, as we go, th go through here and look at, where are we, where are we were at here? Uh, that's, now, now I lost track where I was at here. Parity bit, B register, stack pointer, all data pointer. I was about here. Port registers. Okay. That's the problem with that's the problem with cheating and using the the book instead of writing, spending time writing the slides. But <coughs> right here, what they're saying basically right here, and I talked a little bit about yesterday, is the, this command here clear. Port 1.7 and clear 97 are equivalent commands. They do exactly the same thing. And I could put also there clear red LED. That there, they, they, all three of those do exactly the same thing, right there. Because when I did the equate, I set the red LED at port 1.1, for example. That there. So if I set clear red LED. The, the assembler is going to replace that with port 1.1. Or I can say clear 91 hex that there, which is the bit address for that particular port. So we've got three different ways of addressing the same bit. And that's probably why everybody thinks computer programming is a, a, a challenge because there's multiple ways of doing the exact same thing. My preference is to name your ports in the beginning with the equate commands and use the names. That is my preference. 
that's there. And the reason is, is because if we decide later on that we need to move a particular motor, light, valve, or whatever in our system, we just change the equate. We don't have to go through everywhere in the code and find where port 1.1 is and change that to port 2.3, you know, assuming that we move it out there. We just put all, we define everything at the beginning of our code with equates. And I think many, many of you can tell my voice is going today for some reason out there. So, out there. You know, the, there. another assembler here is following loop would be right, wait for a device to become ready out there. You know, this is kind of an interesting one. We'll talk a little bit. This wait, jump, bite one out there. If the bit is set, this is a very interesting com command, and we'll talk a, a little bit about the loop right here. This wait command right there. Actually, it's not a wait, it's the jump B is the command. Jump or wait is just a label. And this command is an interesting one, is that it says jump if the byte is set, port 1.1, the wait. So it just sits there and waits for that, for that particular set to jump the wait. In other words, jump back and check it again until that pin goes low. As soon as it goes low, it'll, be, it'll go through. So, so we can set up nice little wait commands that they're... The timing registers are ones that we'll use a fair amount. I'm not ready to get into timers right now, but what a timer basically is, is we load it with a register. Every clock cycle, it subtracts one fr from, that, from that there. And it's not necessarily every clock cycle. They get somewhat complicated because we can define what clock we use for it. So it's used to for delays, for counting things, Anytime we have to have use time, we have these timers, and we could also have internal or external signals type count up. So we could count things like eggs coming off an assembly line using these timers right there. So the serial ports we'll talk about right there. So these are all the various ports. The interrupts, we'll be spending quite a bit of time on interrupts there. Again, we talked about the interrupts. Right there, power control, we won't get into that there. I want to just kind of jump into, you know, we've got various power controls. This external memory interface, again, it operates very much like the ADA6. We've got the multiplex lines. We also have the ALE. We will not be accessing external memory right there, but this is showing how we would connect external memory and I don't know how I keep getting that back to right there. So this timing op looks very much similar. I wanted to jump to chapter three, essentially, and we'll come back to chap to this hard external memory. Did I talk a little bit about the reset on this particular processor that there? Right there. Now this one actually has a active high reset, so it's reversed from what we normally would see on the 8086. But as we look at this right here, what we have here is we push this button there, that will discharge this, or that will you know basically take this line high there, and then it goes low. This power on reset basically, we allow this capacitor to charge up to Five volts, which is essentially going to put zero across this right here, right there. Normally, most processors use an active low out there. This one has a reverse right there. Upon power, upon reset, the number one thing to keep in mind is that our program counter resets back to zero. So that's the, so that's why when we did our, when I wrote the code yesterday, I set the start location to zero, and then I did a long jump to main. And main is wherever the compiler happens to put it, right there, or the assembler puts it. But we have to set at least a long long jump to the start of our code there. there. So anytime we actually reset the processor, it will start at a known location right there. And this just defines what everything's set up. The accumulator is always zeroed out, the B register is zeroed out, the status registers are zeroed out. The stack pointer is set to seven. That's the start of our stack. Our data pointer is set to zero. 
all reports are set high right there so but there the the instruction pointers and the extra registers right there that they're set uh, are all zeroed out right there <coughs> now again I'm going to jump I'm not going to get into I'll be citing some questions before next week right there identify the bit at there this is we look at these this homework question like 230 let me point out on problem two, 230 what that's asking you to do is go and look at the table to see where those bits are these are all bit instructions so set bit 84h that is telling you to go back to and and this table's pretty far back it almost if you're going to do that it almost makes sense to have right there 84 is location right here where is 84 at I don't see 84 there 80 right here it is 84 so that's 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 port 0 dot 4 is what is that location right there so I'm looking for 84 here but it's 80 is what I'm looking for out there so you know the stack pointer is at 81 byte address but the bit address is for 81 is and that's where, where I said it gets somewhat confusing you can see that right there on this one right right here what I'm showing here is 82 is the uh, or 81 for example is the stack pointer if we look at a byte address but if we look at the bit address it's port 1.1 1 .1. so the same address points to two different locations whether it's a byte address or a or a bit address so we've got addresses that are bit addresses and addresses that are byte addresses that's there so let me just now what I want to jump into and where I was going to spend most of my time today was talking about the bringing up the instruction set that's chapter three and I apologize my throat is starting actually so as we get into the instruction set right here summary right here we we have a a number of commands and we'll just kind of go through them right here the addressing modes we have eight different addressing modes available to us mm -hmm. eight different addressing modes I, I've covered two or three of them already the first one is register the register one is very easy all we simply do is we're going to point give it the register and what we're looking at is the contents of those registers we have eight working registers, R0 through R7, plus the accumulator, plus B. So we've got about 10 registers that we, we can work with up there. So we've got the address registers, and they're fairly straightforward. I'm not going to worry about the op code right there. Right there. You know, the op code is what you look at in the assembly language card, and that's what equates to what it's saying is that the op code for the following, what is the following is, EF is the instruction for moving the contents of R to A. And you get that from looking at the instruction set in the table and it lists the op code. And if we were to do this back in the old days, right, you actually programmed an EEPROM with the op codes directly. <coughs> the advantage of register addressing, where we're moving from register to register, is that we don't have to include an address. There's an op code straight for a registered register move. The other thing is a registered register move is on the same piece of silicon, but on, on a microcontroller it's, not, it's usually not a, an issue up there. But the all the instructions are going to be of this format, move the destination first and then the source second. And I talked about that a few minutes ago that it goes from right to left right there. There's lots of variations of these we're, we're just going to go through the highlights of it. So, and I'm not going to go through all of this right here, but right there. 
this is actually getting into the op codes that they're, I'm going to skip, skip the op code discussion right there. Direct addressing means that we basically have direct addressing can address any, any on chip or hardware register. In this particular case, we're doing move A to port one. That's considered direct addressing. Even though this, I, re, I would almost call this register addressing here, but port one is not a register. That's actually a special function register, and it's actually treated as a memory location. Port one, as we've been talking about, is memory location 90. So that's actually a 90 is actually the direct address of port one right there. So when we look at that, that's usually direct addressing with a mix of registers. So it's taking the contents of A and moving it to memory location 90, which just happens to be port one is what that is. So that's direct addressing. Indirect addressing means that we're going to be putting an ampersand in front of that and we're going to be looking for the address of, the, of that location. So we could, for, for example, put 90 into R0, which happens to be the address of port 1, and we could say move into A the content, what is pointed to by R0, which happens to be port 1. So that's moving the contents of port 1 into the accumulator. Or we can give it another, another variable. But R0 in this particular case contains the address right there. So in this particular example, it says R1 contains 40, the internal address contains 55, so it's going to move 55 into that there. And this is where what I'll probably do in my little videos kind of go through a bunch of these examples where I show how that's working out there. So again, skip any discussion on looking up the opcodes. I do not expect you to look up opcodes in, <laughs> in a table. That will not be on a final discuss looking up opcodes right there. Immediate addressing, and I keep, reboot is control L, H, okay. If I control H, that's there. Immediate, we've been talking about immediate all along. Immediate, we put the number sign in front of that, and that simply means that we're going to pull the data directly. That's the actual data that we're moving. So in this particular case, we're moving the number 12 and if you don't have the H on there, it's, it'll convert, that, that's decimal. You have to put the H on that for it to be hexadecimal. That there, keep that in mind that, is that you would have the H on the end of it if it's hex. And you, would al you can also do a B as well, which is binary. Out there, I hate to work in binary simply because it's a pain in the neck, but <laughs> that there, because ones and zeros is you, probably guess you can easily make mistakes. But this is going to move the number 12, which is actually 0C hex, into the accumulator. The, the number sign means immediate data. So we've got three different ways of looking at it. If there's nothing there, that means the address. It's, it's direct. If, if we've got the ampersign, means that the contents of that location, that there. So the, that usually you have the ampersand to mean was usually for a register up there. So up there, and we have the number sign means that's the actual data we want to move right there. And keep also I should point out that you will always get a syntax here if on the left side if you put immediate there because you can't move the contents a into the number 12 right there. I mean that's a fixed number. So you will never see the number sign on the left side of the move equation. You, it, it doesn't make sense to do that there. So that there. Another instruction we have is the add. In this particular case, we're going to, this instruction here is we're going to add to the accumulator and store the results in the accumulator, the number 15 is, is what that instruction is right there. So again, this is basically the general format for that. Relative addressing is one that we probably won't spend a great deal of, but 
what it basically means, and the reason we're not going to spend a great deal of time with that is because the assembler takes care of it for us. That there. And what it essentially means is on a jump command, a short jump, we give it a address, a number between negative 127 and plus 128. So it says 127 to, yeah, minus 128 to plus 127. And we're going to jump so many bytes ahead or back. Right there. Normally we would, get, in our code, we would put a label. And we would not calculate how many bytes we're going to jump forwards or backwards. We'll let the assembler calculate that for us. Right there. So you would put a command short jump out there, and we're either going to jump ahead or we're going to jump backwards. Right there. So in this particular case, it's five. We're going to jump five me memory locations ahead in the program, or we're going to jump back right there. And as you recall, I did some jump commands within the, the, the code I did yesterday out there. I don't know if I used the word short jump or, or long jump. Or, or, well, actually, I did the long jump to jump to the to main, but then I did a short jump to, to jump back right there, right there. And if you looked at the assembly, it would actually have the number of bytes it has to jump. The long jump will actually, will actually have the physical address of that location right there. But relative jumping is usually, is just used, relative is just used for the, the jump command typically, and we normally use that, and we're going to use it with a label. We're not going to calculate how many bytes we're going to jump forwards or backwards. Right there. But they call that relative addressing. <coughs> right there. And they get lots of examples of that. Right there. Absolute addressing, that's the, and that's using an A jump. Quite often, you can also use a long jump, and you actually give it the location. Again, we don't necessarily, we don't give the memory location directly. We will use a label within our code right there. But typically, with, the, with our version, we, I just use the long L jump or long jump right there, which means that the jump is beyond 127 bytes or 128 bytes, so it has to have the full address. That there. You can use the A call that there, and a call instruction is different than a jump instruction. And we haven't talked about the difference between the two of them. A call is a function call, like you would do in C where you call a function. Here you're calling a subroutine. And typically before, when you call a subroutine, you push the variables you want to pass to the subroutine onto the stack, and then you pop them back out with that there, and you push the result back onto the stack that there. We haven't looked at using subroutines yet. That's why I haven't talked about the stacks yet. So but when we use subroutines, then, then we'll, we'll be using the stack to pass data back and forth. That's there. And when we use subroutines, we use the call. And normally, we, we would use just the A call. Actually, the assembler, we're using the, the Kyle. It's smart enough to just, we don't have to use short call or long call. It just use call, and, and it will it'll figure out which one, one it needs to be in that there. So I think uh, what's the, there's some examples here. Long addressing, that's the one that does the long jump right there. That there that's long addressing and that's used for long call and long jump. These are three bytes and you get the full 16-bit address right there. So we actually have the we have the relative address for very short calls. We have the, the absolute where we give address in the long, we give the full 16-bit address right there. So these are all part of how we, you know, these are all part of the jump commands right there. Jump and call right there. So, uh, at there, and again, the, the assembler will correct us if we use the wrong one, not there, not there. And then we've got index addressing right there. And the index addressing is probably the most difficult one because it's a mixture. And what this particular one is, is we're doing a move 
up there. And, and we're moving into C, the right there, move, and we're using move C, and we're looking at ampersand A, that's the contents of A, plus the data pointer. So that so and then we can increment A up there. There. So what we're basically doing is it's one byte long, but it actually looks at the data pointer and whatever's in A and adds the two of them together in order to get the, the physical address. Again, very useful for for processing arrays. Up there, where this A would this would contain the address of our, our, our array, and this would contain what the index we are in, in the array, right there. So if we have an array of, say, 30 characters, and we want to look at the seventh character, we would have seven in the accumulator, and we would have the address starting point of the array in the data pointer. So it's a very powerful tool for addressing large amounts of data where we can normally we wouldn't be moving that into the accumulator that there simply look at the move C it's one byte right there moves a byte of data from the code memory well actually it's from code memory to the accumulator right there this is telling us from code memory to the accumulator the address of the code memory is by adding the index present day of the accumulator that there it goes the instruction finishes the data index is lost because it's overwritten so the, the move C is actually telling us to look at the code memory because we've got the code, you know, we have this particular processor, we can set it up where it has data memory and code memory for that there. All right, that's all the various addressing modes. We're, we won't worry too much about the index addressing for now. We're, we'll leave that one rest until we get a little bit more comfortable. The All the jumps and call commands, the relative addressing, the absolute addressing, and the long addressing. Those three, those are used with jump commands. We'll see those from time to time. But the most common one we're going to be using is the register addressing, the immediate addressing, and the, inter or the uh, indirect addressing right there, where we have that there. Those are the three that we're going to use probably the most often, <laughs> that right there. Now. We're going to get into the instruction set right here. And before I do that, let me remember to 